so welcome back to the session on columba olivia uh, here we will be discussing on the exoskeleton of uh, columba the pigeon it is having a well developed exoskeleton system that serves many functions including protection of the body from uh, uh, temperature fluctuations of the environment then uh, radiations and uh, mechanical injuries of various kinds further uh, there are exoskeletal structures that also help in aerial mode of life now the exoskeleton of birds in general it includes horny claws beaks spurs webs scales and feathers okay and these are derived from epidermis and uh, you can see that horny claws beaks scales and feathers are found in columba as well but spurs and webs are not uh, present not found in columba that is pigeons okay spurs are lacking uh, in pigeons and it is uh, usually found in you can see that this is structure which is known as a spur uh, this is the hallux the first top which is extended backward and uh, usually it is found in the uh, galliformis group okay the spur and uh, the spur is a, a bony outgrowth of tarso metatarsus this part okay uh, in the male uh, fowl and some other birds uh, it is covered by a horny scale like uh, epidermal sheet and it is point uh, usually you can see it is pointed in shape okay male fowl use it for fighting and in certain birds like plovers spurs may be found on carp carpometa carpus okay and uh, webs uh, i needn't tell you you are all familiar with webbed feet it is a, actually an aquatic adaptation in birds and webs are actually modified fold of skin found on the feet of aquatic birds such as ducks geese and swans and it is found stretched between the toes in cormorants uh, webs include uh, webs are found in all the four toes and uh, sometimes it leaves the hallux free the horny claws and beaks uh, will be uh, we have already mentioned it in the uh, uh, the previous session and uh, the be beak is covered by ramphothica and all these structures have been mentioned in the uh, external morphological features and the, um, the external morphology of columba lily now regarding scales and feathers in uh, pigeon the scales are confined to to shank you can see here right and also on feet and some uh, at the base of the beak the scales are uh, cornified derivatives of the stratum germinativum of epidermis which form a protective covering of body parts and are shed and replaced by molting so there is periodic molting of the scales uh, present on the body and uh, the scales of pigeons and certain other birds resemble that of the reptilian scales in every uh, respect which indicates the origin of birds from the reptiles Now, regarding feathers, which we'll be looking into in detail, the entire body of uh, pigeon is covered by with a close and continuous covering of feathers, uh, which uh, together forms what is known as a plumage. Okay, it is known as a plumage. it's known as a plumage now feathers are found only in birds and and um, in modified and are modified reptilian scales and they are light in weight strong elastic waterproof and uh, found in many colors due to the pigmentation uh, especially the melanin pigment of various shades as well as due to iridescence iridescence in the sense when light uh, falls on it the reflections it will be different okay now uh, we can see the structure of a typical feather or in pigeon and uh, this we can see that a typical feather consists of yeah one minute okay so a typical feather consists of a central this structure okay the whole structure along the center the central axis okay uh, this is known as a central axis right or it is known as a scapus okay central axis or scapus and uh, the main stem or the scapus and uh, 
expanded distal portion it is known as the vein or vexillum we call it okay vexillum or it is otherwise known as the vein so this is the central axis and this is known as the scapus or axis okay and this expanded portion it is known as the vein or vexillum clear now we will see uh, the structural features of the axis the axis or the scapus it is divided into the basal part which is known as the calamus okay it is hollow in nature and uh, the upper part from here onwards it is known as the rachis or shaft so the whole structure is known as the axis or scapus okay and this it, the scapus is divided into basal calamus and the distal vein or vexilla okay so that is it now the calamus here when we see it is hollow which you are familiar with tubular and almost semi transparent the base of the calamus it is inserted into a pit or follicle of the skin from which a non striated muscle fiber pass into the uh, feather and it helps in movement of the feather okay so this part it is hollow and there is a pore over here right and it this particular uh, part it is inserted into the into a pit which is known as a follicle we found on the skin okay and uh, through this particular pore a strand of muscle extends into the uh, hollow calamus and this helps in the movement of the feather sorry the calamus opens below by an opening known as inferior um umbilicus and which receives a small conical nutritive dermal papilla from the uh, dermis okay the nutrients and pigments are passed through the dermal papilla into the feather and uh, sorry Uh, from the dermis and uh, yeah into the feather from the dermis and during the development of the uh, feather these nutrients as well as the um, pigmentation uh, sorry the pigments are uh, introduced into the feather through the inferior umbil umbilicus okay now another pore which is referred as the superior umbilicus uh, occurs on the ventral side of junction of uh, calamus uh, and rachis uh, can see here okay shaft it is otherwise known as rachis okay so shaft or rachis it meets the uh, calamus or quill okay this is the junction and here there is another hole it is known as the superior umbilicus another pore okay uh, in flightless birds uh, like uh, cassowary emu etc the after shaft is as long as the uh, main feather and arises from the superior umbilicus okay uh, in some pigeons and in many other birds small tuft of soft down feather it is known as a after shaft you, here you can see it is very soft okay so this is known as a after shaft uh, it is otherwise referred as the hyporachis okay occurs near the superior umbilicus okay so superior umbilicus it is found it is an as is a pore found between at the junction between the rachis and the calamus and around from the superior umbilical region arises the down feathers the after shaft okay a small tuft of uh, soft down feathers it is known as the after shaft or hyporachis okay so i hope this is this part is clear now we'll move to the the distal part okay the shaft or the rachis the part of the scapus above the calamus is known as a rachis and it forms the longitudinal axis of the vein okay this part is the vein the extended part okay and it is a solid opaque uh, roughly quad quadrangular in transverse section and filled with a closely packed mass of pit cells we are speaking about the rachis okay a longitudinal furrow you can see here a longitudinal furrow it uh, which is known as the umbilical groove the ventral umbilical groove okay it runs Uh, along the ventral or the inner surface of the rachis throughout its uh, length okay um, you can see here sorry starting almost from the superior uh, umbilicus it extends ventrally all along the rachis okay right now the extended portion is known as the so this was about the uh, rachis or shaft okay the extended portion is known as a vein or vexillum isn't it so this we can see 
the rachis it bears a fan like webbed or expanded membranous portion of the feather and this is known as the vein or vexilla okay this is the outer web or the vein it is otherwise known uh, sorry vein or vexilla okay now uh, the vein is divided by rachis into two unequal lateral halves its proximal end is broader that is why it is written as a inner web and outer web and uh, its uh, proximal end is broader you can see here than the distal end so it tapers uh, towards the distal end and each half of vein is composed of a series of numerous parallel closely placed delicate lateral thread like structures which are known as the barbs so if we take a section of this part you can see this is the rachis or the shaft okay and very delicate and uh, closely placed thread like structures extend out from the rachis and this is known as the barbs okay it is otherwise known as rami right so the barbs are uh, barbs arise obliquely outwards from two lateral sides of rachis so from the rachis on either side starts uh, arises the barbs barbs uh, arises obliquely from the uh, rachis and the size of the barbs gradually decreases towards both the ends of the rachis that is uh, you can see here oh, sorry so these are the these are barbs okay each thread like structure is known as a barb okay and the length of the barb it decreases as we go towards the distal side right uh, and each uh, you can see here uh, each barb on either side bears a fringed uh, fringe of small extremely delicate oblique filamentous processes sorry here you can see right these are known as barbules okay so each barb possesses barbules right these are the barbules which extend out and each barb on either side bears the delicate filamentous processes and these filamentous processes are known as barbs or ram uh, sorry barbules or radii okay you can see here this these are the distal barbules and these ones are the proximal barbules arising from the same barb okay the barbules are of proximal um, are of two types the proximal barbules and the distal barbules proximal barbules directed towards the base of the feather you can see here right and the distal barbules uh, they direct towards the tip of the feather now the lower edge of the distal barbule just one minute okay yeah lower edge of the distal barbule you can see here right this is the enlarged one distal uh, barbule okay and you can see the lower edges over here right it bears minute uh, structures okay hooklets we can say they are known as hamuli not h u it is h a okay hamuli they are hooklets or it is otherwise known as barbicels or hooklets and the upper edge of the proximal this is the proximal one okay upper edge of the proximal barbules are deeply curled or rolled to form a groove and flange okay so this is you can see flange right this is a groove inside okay so there is a groove inside a channel inside and on either side of the groove there is a flange okay i hope it is clear okay right so sorry the hooklets of uh, distal barbules uh, hook over the grooved edges of proximal barb uh, barbules binding the barbs together so this is what happens so you can see here the distal barbule of this one and the proximal barbule of the next barb it gets hooked okay so this is how it happens the hooklets or the hamuli they hook over the uh, yeah here you can see the flange right so this is the flange okay so the flange is extending like this and the hamulus what happens it hooks into the flange okay into that curved uh, red, uh, what do you call edges so what happens these two uh, barbules keep the barbs together clear okay so what happens is the hooklets of distal barbules hook over the grooved edges of the proximal barbules binding the barbs together okay and with this limited sliding interlocking arrangement all the barbs and barbules are loosely held together so that the vein forms a flexible firm wide flat continuous surface for striking the air uh, during flight this interlocking mechanism can be broken uh, broken down so that the barbs become separate but can be joined again by preening the whole uh, feather so you may have seen the birds using the beak to preen the feather actually during this particular process the uh, um, yeah 
the hammer like can very well uh, hook onto the flanges.